Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Father. Mm. Mm. I'll be relatively brief. <laughs> I want to thank Madam Leader. Uh, you know, I have stood in this spot uh, uh, very, very many times. It today, though, feels a whole lot different. Part of it has to do with all the new faces in the house. You look at all the proud spouses, these beaming children at their best. <laughs> People's parents. It's hard, if not impossible, to resist this rush of enthusiasm. There is no sense of foreboding in this house today. There's only the sense of potential. It kind of reminds you that no matter how long you have been here, you haven't seen it all. And so, I just want to say to our new members and to their families, thank you, congratulations, and welcome. <clears throat> to my own priest, Father Paul, thank you for being here with us today. Appreciate it. <laughs> and to my center, my family, Jana, Liza, Charlie, Sam, thank you for all that you have done to make this all possible. Thank you. There's another reason for optimism, and that is what we've already achieved by meeting here this moment. Just months ago, our country held a great electoral contest, and at times it was a little intense. As you all know, when you're in the heat of it, in the heat of the kind of campaign we had, you start to wonder, will the tempers ever cool? Will the system still hold? Does our old rich tradition still have that magic? Well, it turns out it does. The clash of opinions, the hue and cry of campaigns, the rancor and the dissension, in the end, they all dissolve in the silent and peaceful transfer of power. And so, in just a few weeks' time, we will welcome a new president who offers us yet another new beginning, a new chance to work toward a more perfect union. For all of our arguments and all of our differences, we are all united by a deep, abiding love of our country. It is this slender but sturdy thread that holds us together. We always seem to forget this, but it has never failed us. That is why, when the votes are counted and the people have spoken, we all accept the verdict. We come back from the campaign trail, we pack up the yard signs, and today, today, as one body, we pledge allegiance to one flag, the red, the white, and the blue. That's not the only thing that we have in common. I don't care what your party is. Find one person in this house who doesn't want the best for America. Find one person in this house who does not want to see help given to the unemployed, or care for the sick, or education for the young, or honor our troops. Here, who here among us does not want to open wide the door to opportunity? Who here among us does not want every American, every creed, and every color to cross the threshold. You cannot find one person in this building, not one. And that, that is a true cause for celebration. Now, we have a lot to build on. But that being said, this is no time to rest on our laurels, but to redouble our efforts. It's no secret that millions and millions of Americans across this country are deeply dissatisfied with their current situation. 
They've looked to Washington for leadership, and all they have gotten is condescension. For years, they've suffered quietly, quietly amid shuttered factories and shattered lives. But now, now they have let out a great roar. Now we, their elected representatives, must listen. So I want to say to the American people, we hear you. We will do right by you, and we will deliver. <clears throat> we will honor you because you have honored us. We take this sacred trust seriously. You know, it's not enough to say that the condition of your birth should not determine the outcome of your life, no matter how much we mean it. In a few years' time, I hope that the people will say of this 115th Congress that we didn't just pay lip service to this beautiful American idea, that we made it a reality for everyone. We are not here to be, we are here to do. We are here to improve people's lives, grow our economy, keep us safe, improve our health care and our infrastructure, fight poverty, restore self-government. <laughs> Friends, we've got our work cut out for us. As your speaker, I intend to keep this place running at full speed. When I came into this job, I pledged to restore regular order. Get that committee system working again. Hold regular House and Senate conferences because only a fully functioning House can really truly do the people's business. We've made some pretty good progress on that front. Take our work on finding cures for deadly diseases, or beating back that opioid epidemic, or our work on mental health. These are all things that we should be very proud of. These efforts were directed by the committees and crafted by our members all through regular order. There's still a lot of work to do, like having a fully functioning appropriations process, for example. And so, to the minority, I want to say this. We've never shied away from our disagreements. And I do not expect anyone to do so now. But however bright of a contrast that we draw between us, it must never blind us to the common ground that we share. We must never shy away from making progress for the American people wherever we can. And so as your speaker, I promise to uphold the rights of the minority. I promise to hear you out and let you have your say. If I had to sum up, it would be this. Agreement, whenever possible, but at all times, respect. And to the majority, especially to our returning members, I want to say this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This is the kind of thing that most of us only dreamed about. I know because I used to dream about this a lot. <laughs> the people have given us unified government. And it wasn't because they were feeling generous. It was because they want results. How could we live with ourselves if we let them down? How could we let ourselves down? I have for many months been asking our members to raise their gaze and aim high. Now, today, this Congress. Let us not be timid, but rather reach for that brighter horizon and deliver. And so, this old chamber, this old chamber might look the same, but in the hush whispers, in the whirl of activity, you can feel the winds of change. And as I stand here next to that portrait of good old George Washington, I am reminded of a line from one of his favorite plays. Tis not in mortals to command success, but we'll do more. We will deserve it. And so, my dear friends and colleagues, I say to all of you, good luck and Godspeed. Thank you very much.
I'm now ready to take the oath of office, and I ask the Dean of the House of Representatives, the Honorable John Conyers, Jr. of Michigan, to administer the oath of office. Thank you. If the gentleman from Wisconsin would please raise his right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter, so help you God. I do. Thank you. I now pronounce you the Speaker of the House. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.